Hey, we're looking at uh, this series that I've titled Furnace Faith, which deals with uh, extraordinary examples of biblical faith. Uh, faith in extreme circumstances. When the heat's on, the pressure's on, these groups and individuals uh, demonstrated tremendous faith. And we've looked at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, external pressure put on them. We've looked at Abraham and the offering of Isaac. That's internal pressure and that conflict that comes when God asks us to give up something that is precious to us. Uh, and then this week we've been looking at <clears throat> Paul and his stake or thorn or that thing that is sticking him that is sent by God and Satan or an angel of Satan slaps Paul around with it, his weakness. And we saw yesterday that that, um, that weakness, in fact, is the vehicle by which Christ's power is manifested and rests upon him. And that tabernacle language that is used there, this whole Exodus idea that we're going to see today with signs and wonders and that kind of thing, uh, is impressive. And, of course, Paul has been, in chapter 11 and chapter 12, has been taught well in other places in 2 Corinthians, has been arguing like a braggart. Uh, several times, however, he says, I'm being a fool, this is foolishness, uh, and he's going to say that again uh, in the verses we look at today in um, verses uh, uh, 11, 12, and um, 13. As, as we look at those, because we're coming to the conclusion of that argument, and then tomorrow we'll look at really what Paul is getting to, the crux of of why he's writing, but for, for my purposes, it was to talk about the thorn in the flesh, but we'll wrap that up tomorrow. Anyway, um, he talked about, for Christ's sake, when I am weak, then I am strong. Um, he says, I have become a fool, foolish. I've been foolish. And he's going to say, you know, and he's reminded them this over and over again, that bragging and exalting yourself is simply foolish. Uh, it doesn't accomplish anything. It certainly doesn't accomplish uh, the ministry of the gospel. Um, it, 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 it only ends up puffing up the individual who's doing the bragging. And uh, we get enough of that in Christianity today. That A lot of what we see on television is just this bragging on who I am and how great I am and how marvelous I am and, and that kind of thing. Well, Paul says, I have become foolish and hopefully that he has caused them to rethink this whole idea of listing one's accomplishments and these super apostles who have come in there, who had the, you know, my father-in-law used to call, had the pompadour hairdo and, and all that kind of thing and, and had the look and had the voice and had all this. And, and uh, they were saying that, you know, Paul, he just, he doesn't have much of it. He just hadn't got it. He doesn't dress right. He doesn't talk properly. He doesn't uh, have the look. Uh, he's not, look at all, he's shipwrecked. He's suffered. He's done all this stuff. God is not certainly protecting him. And so Paul has done this whole argument thing. He's done this whole arguing, this um, character speech that he's done, or speech of character, as it's called, and he's arguing as a fool, as someone is foolish, and he's showing them, hopefully embarrassing them, um, hopefully causing them to laugh. Can, can Paul be a smart aleck? Yes, he can. He can, he can be quite a smart aleck, and, and you'll see that uh, today. Um, he says, I've become foolish. You, you, you forced me to do it. You forced me to do this foolish bragging kind of thing because this is what you wanted. And so he showed them what he would brag on. He would brag on his beatings, his sufferings for the sake of the gospel because Christ's power is displayed in weakness. And he talks about um, this thorn in the flesh, this stake that was given to him to keep him from being exalted, uh, lifting himself up and being prideful. Because, I, you know, to be honest, I think young Paul was... Uh, somewhat prideful. He longed for the Ezekiel vision uh, that, that most young Jewish men at that time uh, that were uh, zealous for the law, and that zeal was a specific kind of zeal. Uh, it meant to, to get rid of anything that wasn't properly Jewish and 
any mixture of religion that's got to be done away with. And that's why Paul was zealous to persecute the church. But as we looked at one time in uh, devotions, looking at Paul having had Damascus Road experience, he was wanting to see that Ezekiel experience. He wanted to see God, and he did. Uh, but you remember the voice that uh, he heard was the voice of Jesus Christ, the Lord. And he found out that that's one and the same. Uh, but he had those visions. He had, he had those uh, mystic visions, but he never talks about them. Um, and never, this is the only time you hear him talk about it, other than the Damascus Road experience when, when he came to faith in Christ. Um, but he had all of that, but he says, you know, that's nothing. That proves nothing. That accomplishes nothing. nothing. That does not um, communicate the gospel. That does not do anything. And so he says, um, you forced me uh, to do this. You forced me into this foolish speech uh, of this braggadocia, and you made me do it. Actually, I should have been commended by you. And that word that is commended um, is an exact, that's a good use of it, to, to commend someone, to write a letter of recommendation for someone. But it also can mean to stand with. You should have been standing with me. You should have stood up for me. You should have, instead of, uh, you are our letter of recommendation. You yourselves are that. You should have commended me. You should have stood with me. You should have stood by me. You should have stood up for me. But, but you didn't. For in no respect was I inferior to these super apostles, these most eminent apostles, even though, really, I'm a nobody. He says I'm nothing. Now, why does he say I'm nothing? Well, because he persecuted the church. He tells them that in the in, um, earlier. We didn't go through that. He persecuted the church, and that's something that Paul never got over. Paul brings it up time and time again that he is the least of the apostles because he persecuted the church. He himself persecuted Christians. He himself drugged them before the Sanhedrin. He himself uh, was witness to their murder. He himself was involved in that, and Paul never got over that. I don't know. I, I, I'm assuming that Paul forgave himself because Christ forgave him, um, but I don't think he ever forgot that he hauled women and children and husbands and wives and men and boys and girls, that he hauled them before the Sanhedrin in his zeal for Israel, his zeal for Yahweh, uh, and, the, and wanting the kingdom to come and to stamp out this, obviously, this, this untrue sect, and then he found out that it's true. I don't know that Paul ever got over that. Um, I think it's difficult for us, too, when there is something particularly heinous in our lives that we, that we remember, that we recall, um, and Satan brings it up to us from time to time. I, I don't know that we're any different uh, we think of those things. Paul, rather than thinking he was something, realized, mm, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm nobody because of what I did. Uh, and yet, God used him more than any of the other apostles, in my opinion. Um, now, what does that say? It says that <clears throat> even in our failures, God can still use us. Um, you can still teach Sunday school. You can still um, be a witness for Christ. That Christ, even in the midst of that, can speak through you and tabernacle upon you and dwell upon you. Um, and I think that's marvelous. And so Paul says, uh, this gets to the crux, verse 12. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. Interestingly, what he says is this, that the signs of a true apostle were done, and he doesn't say he did them. He is the vehicle for them, no doubt about it. But he uses the passive tense of the verb, which means God is the one who is doing these things, or if you prefer, Christ is the one who is doing these things through Paul. Paul is not saying, I'm somebody, looky, looky, looky what I did. Look at the signs. Look at the wonders that accompanied my apostleship because I'm somebody. It's not what he's saying at all. What he's saying is, I'm a nobody, 
And yet, the signs of true apostleship were done in your midst by Christ through their ministry. And what was what was, what is the greatest sign that people are converted to Jesus Christ? That the church is edified. That is the sign. That is the great miracle. And I know that people want signs and wonders and all that kind of stuff, but you know Satan can do that too. Um, the enemy can do signs and wonders. And if you build your faith on signs and wonders, dear friend, uh, you've made a terrible mistake. The greatest sign, Simeon, that which points to a larger reality, uh, is the fact that people are saved is the fact that people's lives are changed, is the fact that homes are restored, is the fact that um, uh, people are cared for, that the, the poor are cared for, that the sick are cared for, that those who are grieving are cared for, uh, that the community of faith is built up and there's not all of this hatred and meanness and divisiveness uh, within the people of God. That's the sign that what is happening is legitimate, that is true and genuine. Not whether somebody can do signs and wonders or signs and wonders or none. Um, I know that grabs attention and the, uh, the uh, word of faith folks talk about that all the time. You speak that reality into existence and blah, 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 blah. But the real sign, the real legitimating sign that this is authentic is that people's lives are changed, that the community uh, of the church, community of faith, is actually loving one another and living out uh, being the people of God, doing the vocation we've been called to do, and that is to bear the image of God into the world. Love, grace, mercy, justice, these things that we've talked about time and time again. That's what's supposed to be um, the legitimate sign that it's genuine and that it's real according to Paul. And Paul says it's not, he didn't do it. Christ did it through him. Um, that's why he uses the passive tense. You miss that in the English, you won't get that at all. Um, that the signs of a true apostle were performed. This was done through him by Christ um, with, with all endurance, signs, wonders, and miracles. And you know, this is the new Exodus. This is, this is the Exodus that uh, that takes place. This is the liberation. This is the being set free from the bondage of sin and the dark forces and the, those powers that want to enslave us. And this movement to this new creation, this new promised land that we're going to get to experience. And we're, we have the foretaste of that in the Holy Spirit that makes us hunger and thirst for it even more. And I long for that new creation. For in what respect were you treated as inferior to the rest of the churches, except that I myself did not become a burden to you? In other words, Paul labored. He didn't let them pay him while he was there. Brother Rick, do you get paid where you are? I sure do. <laughs> uh, Paul did too. He just wasn't at Corinth. Um, for whatever reason, he did not want to avail himself of that because it was a common practice to um, give uh, remuneration to teachers uh, in the church. Uh, that was simply done. And Paul didn't accept it there. And he says, oh, forgive me for wronging you like this. Forgive me for taking advantage of you. And that I did. So there he is being a smart aleck again. Now, is it tongue-in-cheek? Is he trying to make them laugh? I think he's trying to make them realize, you know, crafty devil that I am, uh, and which he's going to say later when he talks about coming to see them for the third time. Um, he's trying to point out that it is not the one who brags. It's not the one who has the pompadour hairdo. It's not, <laughs> it's not that. The true sign of genuine ministry taking place as people's lives changed um, is the edification of the body of Christ. That's the true sign of legitimate ministry taking place, gospel ministry taking place. And that can and, and we need to realize that in this age in which we live, because 
in the age in which we live, it is all about how you look. It's all about how you dress. It's all about doing the right words. It's all about doing the right music. It's all about doing this, having the light show and having this and having the other thing, having the smoke and having all this. And you have all that and you get a crowd. Woohoo! I'm not against that. But that is not proof that what is going on is legitimate. What is proof that what's going on is legitimate is that people are being saved, people are growing in Christ, the community of faith is loving one another, and that love is being shared in the community at large. People are being cared for. The, the image of God is being born outside the walls of the church. That's legitimate. That's what is real. And it is as we realize that it is not our strength, our looks, our ability, although those are important. You want to have the best ability. You want, like I went to seminary, uh, learned to do Greek and Hebrew and, and theology and all of that stuff for a purpose because I want to be a sharp tool uh, that the Lord can use doesn't mean that if you don't go to seminary, you can't be used. It's just that was my choice. My calling was to go there um, because I wanted to teach in a college or seminary at one point, and God told me, no, that's another story. The, the point is this. Those things are important, but they are not all important. What is important is realizing that it is in our inability our availability is important. Our ability, not so much, because Christ's power is displayed exactly and is perfected, brought to fruition in our weakness. Does that mean we're supposed to be, oh, I need to be weak? No, but what it does mean is you don't think more of yourself than you should. We want to be used by Christ and I would rather glory in weakness that Christ's power might be displayed in me than any ability that I might brag about because I don't have any. Like Paul, I'm nobody. I'm nothing. And uh, I would rather Christ be displayed in me. And I pray that for you too. Hey, listen, I love you. More importantly, God loves you. And he's given his son, Jesus Christ. You might have forgiveness of sin, eternal life, <laughs> and joy indescribable right here and right now. I pray that you know that. I pray that that's yours uh, today. Hey, listen, till tomorrow, I pray God's blessings rest upon you. See you tomorrow.